whatever, whatever practice you're doing, whether you're no-tailing, whether you're working soil, if you're deep tilling, if you're not deep tilling, no matter what, if we're out there on it growing a crop, we're going to lose some, you know, to erosion. That's just a part of it. So we got to learn how to manage that erosion because we want to leave the ground better. It may be not better than we found it, but definitely we don't want to uh, be detrimental to the yep. land. We want to leave it for our children and stuff. And these are all things that we need to be very cognizant of when whatever decisions we're making for our uh, farmer range. Welcome to the Agriculture Podcast. Uh, if you joined us last week, uh, our guest was Jesse Little. And um, if you were interested by that conversation like we were, um, listen back in again this week. We have him back here in studio again. So uh, he'll be um, joining us for the whole episode. So if you enjoyed Jesse last week, here he is again. And I'm, I'm asking for... I'm asking for my benefit in the sense that like if somebody listened to that conversation, because that's really how I portray it to even customers that are thinking about doing it. Do you think that's effective? You know, the way I'm saying, not the way we talked about, but what we talked about. Like if you were a guy that was never doing planter fertility, would you listen to something like we just talked about and go, Oh, that makes sense to me. I would, because I think everybody is somewhat curious about it. You yeah. Know? I think it's one of them things where, at first, it was a novelty, you know, yeah. and you had a few people interested. And then uh, as though, you know, as your early adopters uh, began to get successful in it and were making notable improvements in it, you know, then the neighbor begins to notice, you know, and then he gets on board with it, maybe adds it to his planner. And and then the people that are have been totally total naysayers to it, and they're like, uh, uh, you know, the early adopters doing it, now the now my neighbor's doing it and i'm now i'm curious you know it's it's become you know a big part of western kentucky ag now i I think you're seeing more planters with it now than without it maybe maybe not there may still be a 50 50 blend but now it's pretty common to see it on the planters versus six years ago very few yeah so yeah i would think uh it's a very effective uh way if you're if you haven't been doing planter fertility, I think, you know, and I'm in that mindset of I'm not sure if it's working or not. I would rather not hear a cheerleader on it and hear somebody that, uh, you know, hey, has can be critical of it, but still say, you know, I have seen some advantages to it. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's where what I would want to hear. Yeah, that's where I'm at today. Like I, I. Th- I still would have it on my planner, um, but I my recommendations look different today than they would have when we began because we, we well this guy's doing this and this guy's doing that and he's putting this on and I want this product and he said it was the best product ever and you know you you figure out you you build the foundation out of the products we talked about in a commodity way that's cost effective to you and then you can you can do plus ones after that. That we test and we sure. validate, make yeah. sure they work. But that's the foundation. It's pretty simple, really. You know, I, I would agree with that. Like, I, I've seen that there, there, you know, you know that if you put, you're going to have to have nitrogen anyway, mm-hmm. you know. So that's a good time to get your nitrogen out there. You're already making the pass. You might as well have nitrogen on there. It doesn't take that much extra time, you know, to get your stuff equipped. And uh, logistically, if you just had one truck out there carrying nitrogen, your sulfur can be blended on board. Yep. You know, you can put it on your rig very easily. Uh, usually only requires one extra man. And you could even do it by yourself, you know, if you're willing to get off your planter and go load the tank and bring it back out there. So It's funny, we, we ended we ended the, the planter fertility conversation with uh, compaction issues. I think we, we could probably do a whole nother podcast on that because I, <laughs> no farmer wants to hear that. And that's been my biggest struggle is how to communicate that that's not offensive you know i think nobody ever wants to hear that they're doing something wrong yeah but and i think you know farm this is one of our worst problem as farmers you know we are everyone is so sold out to their own individual operation that um they're consumed with it you know because it's just such a big part of your life 
and you take so much pride in it, you know, and and you give so much, you give your whole being to that uh, farm, you know, or ranch, and uh, you don't want to hear somebody say, hey, you're doing a poor job of management on that farm or ranch, because you want to feel like, hey, I've invested my whole entire life in this thing. Uh, you want to hear people say, hey, you've done a good job. I know. <laughs> but we as farmers and ranchers need to hear that, you know, so, I mean, how are we ever going to bet? better ourselves if we can't hear uh criticisms the the most effective way i've communicated that was this past year and y'all had pretty dry weather up here we and there were some places there were some 90 hundred bushel corn up yeah. here in typically 180 bushel environment sure. right so um you personally know how i feel about diamond harrows right and it and I'm on board. You know okay. how much I, there's nobody that hates them worse than <laughs> okay. that. Okay. But again, that's like slapping somebody's mama. People people get really sensitive about that. But there was a gentleman this past uh, year that went through the really, really dry weather. And uh, again, weather weather trumps all. So weather weather is a bigger factor than compaction. So I'm not taking away that we had really dry weather. I think his outcome could have potentially been different if we didn't have a compaction issue, especially in dry weather. That's when it really really rears its ugly head right um but the best way i found that i've communicated the most effective way i've seen that communicated uh personally was we we went around to fields and he wanted to know yield estimates so we'd walk out in a field and i took a shovel with me and uh because i know he did um multiple multiple applications of a of a diamond hair for multiple years so when he gets in the springtime He's probably doing two applications, not just one. And you and I both know they're never done. I mean, I say well-timed tillage application. Diamond hairs are never well-timed, right? It's always wet, and that's the reason we're running them, right, to dry it out. Um, but we dug plants in every field, and he didn't really notice what I was – he noticed what I was doing, but he was more concerned with what the corn was going to make. So every field we'd walk in, he'd say, hey, what do you think this will make? I said – man in a dry year every spot you walk in is going to feel different i said I, i'm going to guess 115 you know looking at looking at a we could look at an ndvi image and you'd be like okay we're in a pretty average spot in the field okay uh, so i'd be like 115 bushel i'd dig up a plant and i'd throw it in the back of the side by side we'd go to the next field what do you think this will make what's this one going to make so you dig it up and he wasn't even really, he wasn't noticing me digging plants. He was just wanting to know, what's this corn crop going to make? So we get done and we get back to the farm. And I, he said, hey, what, what, were you, what were you doing out there? I'm like, I was just digging up some plants. I said, I thought we'd bring them back here and we'd look at them. So I, he's talking and I'm washing them off with a garden hose. And it looked like a pie platter, right? It was about as deep as a pie platter, a couple inches deep. And it was as big around as this desk, just, you know, probably a foot in diameter were the roots and they were about an inch deep. And I never criticized. And I just said, smart guy, right? This guy, this guy's a good producer. And I said, I just need you to answer this question. Is this how they're supposed to look? I didn't say you have a compaction problem. I didn't say I don't like your piece of tillage equipment. I just said, is this how they're supposed to look? And it was like this eye-opening experience. You know, he answered it for himself, and he's like, no. Now he gave me permission to say what I think caused it because he recognized that those roots are not supposed to look like that. And, and I go back. I think these all connect. We have a huge potassium problem. I think that root dig is part of the reason we see that potassium issue in tissue samples so so take take base saturation take concentration out of it i think if we eliminated some of those issues our tissue samples and really at the end of the day what's in the plant matters more than what's in the soil granted they're correlated but what's in the plants what really drives the yield right because um, we've all seen super high concentrations of one thing may not correlate to how it looked in the plant for sure. From a tissue sample perspective. But that was eye-opening. And I think we could probably have a whole segment on compaction, uh, pieces of tillage uh, equipment that uh, I think we'll sit around a coffee shop in 10 years and we'll go, that was the most destructive piece of equipment I've seen. 
yeah. ever. We've seen a few of them over the years, you know, here in Western Kentucky. And but I, to me, uh, if you could pin me down and say what is your absolute most hated piece of tillage equipment, and I'm not against tillage, I'm not sitting no, here knocking neither. tillage. Me neither. I think it's a it's an incredibly effective practice. Sometimes it has to be done. There's also times that it doesn't have to be done, but it will benefit your yield. Mm-hmm. So don't think I'm sitting here knocking tillage overall. Absolutely. I'm just saying from a perspective of someone, I, and I'm, you know, a big percentage of my uh, acres are in no-till and have been in no-till a very long time. And I'm just one of those guys that uh, that people probably shake their head out because I'm going to spray it down or I'm going to plant into it green and there's not going to be anything but a planter pulled out there yep. on it. So that, but also I have a percentage of my operation that is traditional tillage, you know, like every now and then I'll run a plow uh, you know, like a, like a no-till type plow or a ripper, whatever you want to call it. And then I'll come back with a, like a turbo till type yeah. implement and work the soil down almost every year. So, but, uh, to get back to it, my very most hated piece was the Phillips Phoenix Hera. You know, I think to me, it basically did nothing but toss the residue around on the tro- top and it puts an extra layer of compaction on your soil. Mm-hmm. And uh, I pulled them around here for a lot of years, learning about them, and uh, and then the evolution of that was the diamond uh, Hera, yeah. you know. And it does make the field look beautiful when it pulls yeah. over it. It knocks the ruts out of the field. It takes your small vegetation out. It kind of mixes residue. But um, you're right. It's always made at the time when the soil is marginal. You you probably shouldn't be out there in the first place if you can't pull the planter on the soil and feel good about it. You don't need to be out there with a piece. At of least lo- locally, that's how they've been used. I'm not saying oh. you can't go to Boot Hill, Missouri, and they're pulling them over a sand farms or whatever. You know, whatever they're doing, but here locally, sure, I'm talking in, to- in West Kentucky. They they have been done at a time of the year in a heavy clay based soil that is is not r- real good timing. Hey guys, Clayton here. I'm interrupting your podcast right now to tell you about my media company, Atlas Media Solutions, that uh, makes this podcast possible as well as all the Denton Farms media happen. So I'm going to play a quick ad real quick that I put together. It doesn't really explain that much, but it does sound pretty cool. So I'm going to let you guys listen to that, and afterwards I'll explain to you what the business is all about. Spend enough time on the internet these days, you start to realize there's a lot of people who don't really understand where their food comes from, what's going on. I figured, hey, rather than complaining about this problem that I feel like the agriculture industry is facing, I should do something to fix it. My name is Clayton Lind. Um, the purpose of this business is to do one thing. Thanks for listening to that, guys. Um, I won't spend too much time explaining what Atlas Media Solutions is, but uh, Atlas Media Solutions is my media marketing company that 100% exists just to serve agriculture. Um, A lot of my time is spent on the road or on a plane traveling around the country producing high quality media material for different ag businesses. Um, And so if you guys want to learn more, please feel free to check out our website or follow me on Instagram. Um, But we just wanted to kind of plug this to let you know that because of this business that I run, it allows all of this um, stuff with Neil and the YouTube channel to happen in the first place. And so as long as we are sponsor free, I will continue to tell you that this podcast is brought to you by Atlas Media Solutions. And we are proud to say that we are um, here 100% to serve agriculture. So that's appeal, guys. I'll let you get back to the podcast. Enjoy. Thanks. You know, this is I'll parlay it by saying this. I have uh, Jesse and I both have really good friends in southern Illinois named LaFonce. They're a predominant river bottom. Uh, yep. And they have lots of sand soils, lots of very, uh, you know, good. Coarser. L- yeah. Some loam as well. And uh, they're in that application, they're very, they work great for them. They don't put that uh, compaction band that you'll see on, on our slopes. Uh, yep. So in that, you know, aspect, that, hey, that's a good tool for them. Just here in, in my geography and uh, in Jesse's geography, he's mostly selling here in western Kentucky on our slopes. Um, I feel like they're very detrimental. I, I have related um, that particular piece of tillage equipment to cocaine for a farmer. It's like a drug. And the reason I say it is, is you you do it with immediate satisfaction 
because when you get done pulling it locally, um, dust is flying behind the planter. It may be blue mud underneath it, but dust is flying behind the planter and you're feeling really good about yourself. It's like the high after an addict, right? With no, um, no awareness of long-term consequences. And, and so it, you go back to it. You, you you go out there and somebody's running a piece, you know, running one, and then they're planting behind it. So, what are you going to do? It's it is. It's like crack. It's like crack to a farmer. Um, I, I don't mean that in a nasty way. It's just it's very similar in the fact that when you get done, you immediately feel really really good about it, but you're not. You have no awareness, or you're not recognizing how this is impacting you long term. I think another drawback to it is, and I, I don't want to just sound like I'm just killing the thing. Yeah, but, that's right. Um, but like whenever you're uh, pulling it over the field and say you have uh, prior uh, history in that field of 200 bushel corn crop. So you have all that residue out there, you know, and then you've just pulled a 70 bushel bean crop off of it or 80 bushel bean crop or what. I don't know. You know, whatever size of crop you pulled out, there's a ton of residue out there. Mm -hmm. And then here comes the diamond hera, and he's, he's just working an inch or two inches deep, uh, however heavy of a, of a blade you got on that thing. And it's incorporating all that trash into the first two inches of the soil. Yeah. And then the planter is planting at two inches. And so you're leaving all these air pockets and voids for the seed to lay beside a corn stalk or a bean stalk or whatever trash might have, a weed, whatever yep. was in that field. And your seed's not even touching soil. It's touching residue that the diamond hera has kicked up. And what I found a lot of times with those uh, Phillips and Phoenix heras uh, is that you'll fluff that top up and it, and it will look dry. But when you brush it back just half inch or an inch, you are right. You're in like a blue mud type, you know, and you're just smearing the sidewall. And then you do wind up with situations where you have those pancake roots. Yeah. I found myself, you know, so there's, there's the both ends of the spectrum on tillages. You're either a no tiller or you're a conventional tiller, right? I, I'm going to start a new one. I'm a timely tiller, right? I mean, I think you, you never say never back to our conversation earlier, but I, I am a erosion fanatic. Like I it drives me nuts. It gives me uh, anxiety to see ditches and fields and dirt in the ditch and everything else. But uh, timely tillage applications are fine. But I, I think the other thing that if you look at locally that is added to what I think is a large compaction problem, that's rearing its ugly head in nutrient deficiencies, but it's the driver for a lot of those nutrient deficiencies, uh, the compaction is, and that is we've adopted a lot of no-till, um, but some of the worst compaction I've seen is in only no-till where there's nothing on there in the fall. There's, there's nothing really working that dirt that much, right? Like a cover. So I've kind of come to the conclusion uh, on my own that I do believe if you're going to go down, down a no-till road, it has to be married with some type of living root. Yeah. You know, as, as long as possible throughout the season. I think we made a good first step by saying, hey, we're going to no-till. Um, but not if, if I say I'm going to no-till for the next 20 years, I man, you can still have big – I guess the misconception is is you don't have a compaction problem if you no-till. And I found that to not be true. No, I agree. Not be true at all. We actually did some trial work with a strip till rig uh, for two years in a row. And I guess it had been 2021 and 2022. And I did the same thing I kind of did with that fertility planner. I took a strip till rig and um, H&R AgriPower let me use that. And I just drove it around from farm to farm. And I'd do some fertility bands in there. And I'd spread some on top. And I'd just see if there was anything to this strip till in the purchase area. And I'll tell you personally, I drove that tractor. Some of the hardest places it pulled was in long-term no-till. Sure. Um, but again, I'm a big no-tiller, but I do think because we no-till and most of us don't cover crop, that's part of the reason we're getting some compaction issues too. You know, one of the reasons we started no-till, uh, I mean, no-till was erosion, but then when we started cover cropping was because go. we were beginning to compaction. see compaction in our fields. And what we were also experiencing, and, and I got to go, um, you know, I've got to be buddies with some of the farmers on the other side of the lakes that ha are also no-tillers, and um, but they're not cover cropping yet. And what they were experiencing was what I experienced early earlier in our no-tilling career was you do, uh, when you're no-tilling, 
you stop losing soil on your slopes and a lot of times on your ridge tops, mm -hmm. you know. But then your water wants to sheet down very fast, and your gully in the center gets washed out um, because your water is sped up so much running off these slopes and ridges because they're not broke open, you know, and they've been in long, they've got tons and tons of matter on top. Uh, those gullies begin to wash out very bad on you. And if you're not applying a cover crop or your grass waterway there, your ditches aren't very wide, but they're very deep. Yep. And uh, the larger rainfall amounts that we get, the deeper those gullies get. And then over time, they're almost unmanageable. You know, they become a huge problem. And, um, you know, we uh, began to address that by cover cropping the entire field. You know, first we were just cover cropping the gully, but you're still not slowing your water down that That's much. Right. So we were still having issues, you know, with water speed. Yeah. And uh, when we begin to cover crop everything, you know, just having that extra matter that's growing on the field spreads the water out enough and slows it down enough that that begins not to be a problem anymore. And uh, in that, in, you know, trying to save our gullies, it's begin, and I'm not saying we don't have compaction problems because I can point to you some spots in the fields that I know are showing compaction problems. Like you can see, like when we were getting into that really hot July period and, and our fields were really beginning to stress hard, you could pick the compaction spots mm -hmm. out in those fields. You could see maybe where a sprayer had run the same time for 20 years or the same, you know, the, the same exact pass for 20 years in a row. You could see that tire mark. You could see where the combine had maybe cut down a little bit because it was too wet that day. So you could pick out all those problem spots. So, but I will say that after I uh, began to implement cover crop over a broad a number of acres over consecutive years, some of those problems have begun to work themselves out. Better Not, infiltration now. Better infiltration, yeah. yep. It has begun to remedy the problem. Not that it fixed it overnight. Yep. It's one of those things where it just takes a long, when you, you can create the problem very rapidly but it takes a long time to fix the problem once you've created it. Yeah. And I, you know, you go back, I go back to, to the diamond hair conversation and, and uh, you always have to put yourself in somebody else's shoes to understand them. And, and I think where, where I think all that got started and I think there's some validity to it is, is you take a really large producer, right? Let's say he's got around here, let's say he's putting out, you know, five, six, 7,000 acres of corn. Okay. He doesn't have very many days to get that done. Right. And so if you're a large, if you're a really large producer, you actually, I, I'll buy into this a little bit that you have to prioritize, you have to prioritize a stand over compaction, right? Yeah. Because you got to get across that many acres in a short period of time. So again, if I put myself in their shoes, I see why. Sure. I see why those pieces of tillage equipment are running around here and people are doing it because in, in their defense, it is more important if you got 5,000 acres of corn to plant in West Kentucky in multiple fields, right? All the time, you know, yeah, it's not like you're going to get out in one field and just <laughs> no, knock this out no, that, that you actually, um, from a financial perspective, uh, and a logistical perspective, you have to prioritize a stand of corn, which you'll get a really good stand of corn behind a, a diamond era. Um, you have to prioritize getting a stand over, compaction and i think that's where they probably do have a fit is for those type of producers that that is the focus stand gotta get it because sure. i only got i got this many acres to get across yeah you know and i think you know there's been some people that have been very successful with a with the diamond uh tillage system mm -hmm. uh that are prioritizing stand you know and hey and there's a lot of seasons where we're going to get a nearly perfect rainfall amount here everything's going to fall into place and it's really not you're going to have a, a great corn crop behind one of those pieces of tillage yeah. equipment so it's like you know environmental conditions matter and all this stuff but we do have to be very cognizant of what we're doing in these fields because we are uh you know we can either um you know create problems very easily you know but it's very hard to fix those problems once we create yeah. them so we need to be very uh and plus, it's expensive to, to use oh, all this man. stuff, you know. So we need to make sure that we are using the right fit for our farm on the right day. And it, it's critical to, you know, if we were wanting to um, make the most, you know, bushels we can make, 
the most efficiently, we need to take into consideration all these different problems. How, how many how many of my customers listen to this podcast? <laughs> I would think that you probably have several. <laughs> I'm like, I'm I'm sitting there thinking, well, maybe I need to redo my forecast on seed because anybody who's running a diamond hair is probably not buying Pioneer seed from me next year. (laughs) It's only because I love you that I say those things. (laughs) I promise. (laughs) No, I mean, I I think, uh, you know, I think most people, um, I think a lot of times people realize, you know, that they're not optimal, but you're right that people will prioritize a stand. And hey, there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing worse than looking at a pitiful stand. Yeah, yeah. and in that operation, that's what makes sense. So yeah. it, it's back to there is no, um, you know, Bible or gospel in farming for everybody, no. right? It's it's not universal. Everybody's got a different situation. That's right. And you know, hey, there might be somebody that's using you know some type of inline ripper uh, every fall. And then um, they are getting out there at, at the right timing with that diamond Hera, and they're working that ground down, and it's yeah. working great for them. That's right. So, it, you know, every every situation is different. We were just speaking in broad brush strokes. All right, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> no more diamond Hera. Yeah, no more diamond Hera. That's offensive. <laughs> so uh, if we're going to get, uh, if we're going to talk about uh, more, uh, soil health type stuff uh and less about mechanics um i know that lately you've been really interested in in the biological Mm -hmm. uh part of agriculture and uh and all those new uh options that are coming on board of the farmers such as uh you know humix and sugars and um amino acids all these different types of things and you can approach it from all kinds of different uh you know, you can make foliar applications of it. You can have it on board the planter by two by two. You can have it on board the planter by um, by infura. You can stream it down. Uh, I even see that there's now a humic that you can apply in a dry form. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you can also use all types of manures and litters, which we both agree is probably our most effective way to build soil fertility. Uh, that's the organic form of it, you know, definitely. Um, but what have you learned or seen or excited about in that, uh, space? I I tell you, that's been, um, that's been an evolution for me, which I think most people that go down that road of soul health, it is, it's not like you, you're bought in one day and you didn't believe in it the day before. And, and I, I had two experiences that's made me more interested in it. And and those are, I'll, I'll name both of them. Um, the first year I had that planner, I did some strip trials of humic acid. And, uh, none of them paid, none of them paid. And so uh, I had a lot of farmers aware that I did those trials. So they asked me, they're like, Hey, what about, what about, what about humic acid? I've been hearing about humic acid. I'm like, man, I did, I did 10 locations and, uh, it was a negative, like did not pay for itself. Don't do it. And one of those growers was using it already. And, uh, he, I'm actually proud. He did not listen to me. He, he continued to use it and he continued to focus on what he believed was some soil health products. And I'll tell you, it was eye opening. We, we were in his farm one day and, uh, again, we talked about, it's hard to quantify soil health products. Like I, I'm quantifying things because I'm running strips and side sure. sides and, and stuff and weighing them. Um, but soil health, you just, man, you can't quantify it. Well, you can, but it's hard. It's, it's more it's difficult. Very difficult. And, and, uh, there was, uh, there was a fence row. And, um, he was farming on one side and, uh, he was using humix very heavily. He was doing a lot of soil health initiatives, um, very, very little tillage, uh, cover crop. I mean, doing the right things. And the other guy was con- convinced in his farm, his, his, his crop looked fine, but, um, I'll never forget. We, we like digging stuff up. So if we're out in the field, I, I like taking a little shovel and digging something up and I'll never forget. I, I dug one of his roots and I don't know why I just had a wild hair to walk across the fence line. And I dug up one of the neighbors, one, a customer of mine, um, dug one of his roots. And the biggest thing I noticed was you're gonna think I'm crazy, but do you remember you hunt? Obviously we, we know you do, but uh, you remember those little cans you used to get that was a cover scent and there were scent wafers? Sure. And they had like pine and earth and all those other things. And you used to, you know, you'd pin them to your camo jacket and you just kind of smell them all day. And they smelled like a, 
you know, used, you know, old leaves or something, you know. I'll never forget. I, I picked his up, and, and he's like, smell that. And I'm like, okay. So I hold it up to my nose, and I smell it. it that's like the, I'll never forget. Like, my mind went back to those scent wafers that were called Earth. You know, I'm like, I'm like, oh my gosh, that smells so good. And I grew up in central Illinois. So I love that we really got the smell every fall when we did deep tillage. Right. Um, but it reminded me of that and it brought back that memory. And then, and then because I smelled his, I'm going to smell the other guys. Like, and it was just like smelling this desk, you know, there's nothing. Sure. It didn't smell like anything. Yeah. And, and again, can't quantify that. Right. But, but that was an experience I had that I'm like, you know, I, I know it's not one thing he's doing. It's a lot of things he's doing, but I can't imagine that the way that smells versus the way that smells can't be a good thing. Sure. You know, it's a good thing. Yeah. Right. And so that, that kind of started that. And then the other experience I had was we've kind of been taught that if you're constantly removing stuff, so let's say you're a silage guy or you're uh, you know, you're putting a cover crop out and you're bailing the cover crop or whatever. That's all, you know, look at the removal rate of these things and everything else. It's killing your soul. But we had this, we I still got a guy that um, he's planting a corn crop. He's putting um, a cover crop rye out there or wheat, and he's grazing that all winter long. And he considers that removal, right? Because, you know, he, he put that rye out and those animals, you know, it's pulling up nutrients um, from the soil and those animals are eating it. And in, and in a weird, weird way, that guy thinks he's removing that from his farm. And he's had this expectation that because he's so intensely using his land by putting a corn crop, planting a green crop in the fall, grazing it till March, eating it down to nothing and then planting another crop and doing that again. He's constantly, you, you can imagine how it feels that you're removing things um, from, from those farms. Um, he had the expectation. He's been doing that several years now. He's had the expectation that he'd see his soil samples go down and he had an expectation that he'd see his yields go down, but it made sense for him because he had feeder calves and he wanted to utilize a farm more than four months a year. So that was his, that was the reason for doing that. What's odd is, is um, you talk to soil health experts, and I'm not necessarily one of them. I'm getting really, really interested, and I'm making sure I educate myself on stuff like that. But you talk about animal impact. Those You hear it now more. You talk about, you know, okay, first is no-till, and then when you figure out no-till, you move into cover crop. And when you figure out no-till uh, cover crop, you start talking about, hey, if it's possible, some animal impact on that farm would be really good. Just that cycling of nutrients through a, a, a ruminant animal and then defecating that out back out on the ground and the, the saliva and all those things that, that they're doing to that farm. He's not only seen his soil samples go up, he's also seen his yields go up every year. And you look at it, you're like, boy, he's removing a lot of stuff. He's taking a 200 bushel corn crop off. I don't know how many tons of, you know, annual ryegrass or wheat those animals are eating per acre, but it's a bunch. Um, that was my second experience to, you know, to think there's something to this, right? Living roots all winter long, animal impact, soil samples are going up, yields are going up. He's optimizing that farm from a profitability perspective. I mean, what a great way to marry all those things. Sure. And I think, you know, Clayton loves to talk about this. He's kind of got some background in cows and stuff. And, uh, you know, I mean, God designed it for uh, a grassland to be consumed by a ruminant, you yeah. know, and then defecated out, and then the whole cycle starting back over, yep. you know. And uh, and when we removed those, you know, like here in Kentucky personally, you know, at, when Lewis and Clark came here, there was huge herds of deer, elk, and buffalo grazing these lands, you know. And there was periodic areas of forest and swamp. But there was also large expanses of grassland, especially here in the western end of the state. And uh, we first removed the deer, elk, and buffalo from the land. But then they got replaced by cattle, you know, here until basically the 90s. Um, like here in Ballard County especially, you know, you had your... Uh, each little individual farm had a couple acres of tobacco, 40 acres of soybeans, and a lot of cows. And then, you know, as those cattle were taken off the pasture, the, the pasture turned into cropland, uh, there has been no animal impact since. Yep. So, um, you know, 
we're seeing, uh, I think now that if we went back to that model of adding animal impact in with our uh, no-till and our cover crops, we would actually see benefit from that. And hey, there's a lot of really good authors that if you read their stuff, have already adapted this uh, type of agriculture to their particular operation have been, been very successful with it. So and very new to Western Kentucky. We knew we do have a couple of producers here that uh, are progressive and have been, uh, you know, and you can see their farms are benefiting from it. Like they're buying land, they're getting bigger. Yeah. Uh, like that goes to show you that their theory has been very successful and that's something that each one of us need to look at. I think it would be beneficial. And, you know, I mean, this goes, this is not, uh, like, I, I'm not a pro-government guy, you know. But the government does want to see this type of integration. So, you know, the government wants to see animals uh, in a vertical uh, system with crops. And so you know, they are going to, I think, start pushing for that anyway. And if it's already beneficial to us, um, why don't we begin to look at that pretty hard? Yeah. You know, and we were, we were talking about experiences, you know, so I had that experience with smelling the earth wafers, you know, type of deal. And then you know, a customer that's doing, you know, animal impact and all those, and what's, what's happening there, but go back to 20, you didn't have much of a drought in 2022, but the other seven counties to the south of you, there was a lot of uh, 70, 80, 90 bushel corn, severe drought, the worst one since 2012. And it's funny, they'd go, you'd get a guy and he'd go, yeah, but I, man, I don't know, I had one farm made 125. And I've got to the point I figured out I can nearly ask him, and most of the time it's right, I said, when that come out of CRP? And he said, oh man, three years ago. You think about, so there's something to it, right? You can't, you can't say there's not something to soil health um, that is beneficial. Again, hard to quantify it, but in a roundabout way, we are, we can put the pieces of the puzzle with how, look how CRP performs in a row crop situation when it gets pulled out. It's phenomenal, especially if you have a dry year. If you have a dry year, if you had 10 farms and one of them came out in CRP, at least within the last five years, that'll be your best farm. And I think it goes back to sure. the whole soil health initiative. So I'm, I'm bought in on it from a product perspective. Um, we're working through a lot of different biological products that we think make sense, but take all that aside. We are in the bit, you know, I'm, I'm in the business of selling stuff, but I don't think that initiative starts with buying products. I think that initiative starts with changing practices. And there's a difference, right? Most people are like, okay, I'm going to go down that. I'm going to start buying these humics and I'm going to do these biologicals and all this stuff, but they don't change any practices on the farm. And I think practices have to trump products when you go down that road. So we are looking at products, but my recommendation would still be, hey, the no-till, cover crop, animal impact, all that, if you're going to go down this road, is way more important than the products I test to tell you to put on your planner. I would totally agree with that. Like, um, you know, all that, all those decisions matter. Um, and we know that like your soul, if you're out there working it or whatever, whatever practice you're doing, whether you're no tilling, whether you're working soil, if you're deep tilling, if you're not deep tilling, no matter what, if we're out there on it, growing a crop, we're going to lose some, you know, to erosion. That's just a part of it. So we got to learn how to manage that erosion because we want to leave the ground better. It may be not better than we found it, but definitely we don't want to uh, be detrimental to the yep. land. We want to leave it for our children and stuff. And these are all things that we need to be very cognizant of when whatever decisions we're making for our uh, farmer ranch. Yep. And I think it, it's, it, locally in the purchase area, it's funny. We, we were talking earlier um, before we started the podcast about I just got back on a trip. Uh, we went pheasant hunting in South Dakota. And it's amazing I go up there and they, they know what animal impact is up there. I mean, they've, they've got cows out on, you know, winter cover crops in a lot of the places I looked at. Um, down here, you know, if a guy wants to start looking at animal impact, the one, a bit, again, the middle, the work's done in the middle, um, I have, I have mama cows. I run a cow-calf operation. Um, I don't run a feedlot, and I don't have feeders. 
But if I started to look at animal impact on my personal farm that gets row cropped, it would not locally, it would not be with mama cows. You know, we got a lot of clay. We don't, we don't get cold and stay cold, right? We're up North, you know, the mess that their cattle make a 1400 pound cow or a 1500 pound cow makes on the ground is a lot less than it is down here when it's warm and it's wet and we have clay soils. I love it as a cattleman when it gets cold and it stays cold because it's not messy at all. They're not rutting things up. They're not tearing things up. It's wonderful. I love it. But that's not what we deal with. It's maybe cold one day and frozen the next day. It's thawing out and it's a bigger mess than it was the day before. But I have noticed I would not personally turn my cow-calf operation out um, on row crop fields to have animal impact in the wintertime. Let me back. I would do that. Um if I picked my times, if I had a place to pull them off real quick, I knew it was going to rain, you know, and I didn't want them to be out there and making a mess. I'd pull them back off pretty quick. But if you're going to leave them out there for, for multiple months, um, the three, 400, 500 weight calves, they're not even in our soil as messy as these clay soils can be in the winter time. You know, I walk out there and I'm like, it doesn't look bad at all. Where if you turned out a bunch of 1600 pound mama cows, it, it could get gutted. Pretty fast. Pretty fast. Um, so I guess if anybody's thinking about doing that, you know, I, I love animal impact so far on what I've seen, but to do that with mama cows, it's got to be really timely and it's got to be on and pull them off and on and pull them off depending on the weather where the feeder calves, those three to 600 weight calves, it, it could be raining four days in a row and it just seems like they don't, you know, they don't make that much of a mess. Right. I, I've seen that. Uh, you know, like I've been interested in watching Indiana a little bit because they're beginning to, uh, like if you drive down the interstate there, they're beginning to pull these uh, containment barns up to the corner, the field corners, you know, and that way if, hey, if you see a weather event coming, they're running these cattle back into these containment barns, letting them, uh, you know, s- stay there two or three days until the weather gets nice again. And then turning them back out, yeah. you know, so maybe that's an option for us. That's here. my, that's my dream on my personal farm is, is to have something like that. Obviously capital's hard, you know, cow calf operations aren't, you know, at least at my level are not very profitable. Um, I love it because I have a full-time job. You know, you, a guy goes down the road of getting feeder calves. He's going to be dealing with sick ones every day. It's a full-time job, sure. full-time job. Your vid these mama cows down here, if you got the right genetics and the right cows, you, you could go put out some hay or, or take good care of them. And you may not look at them for three, four days, you know, call me a bad cattleman, but people get busy. You, you got a full-time job. So I don't see myself getting out of cow calf operations, but I want to figure out how to get the animal impact and the efficiency of instead of buying hay <laughs> in the winter time to, I cover crop my farm anyways. But guess what? I don't utilize the cover crop. We just burn it down in the spring and we plant another, you know, we plant another full stuff, corner of bean crop behind it. And I've got to figure out how to marry those things. And to your point, I think it is some type of confinement barn located, you know, pretty close to it where I can pull them off and, and put them back on. Cause I feeders, feeders work for people that farm full time, probably for somebody like me that doesn't farm full time. Um, cause you know, I sell seed and got a public job that the cow calf thing's really nice, but I got a, it's funny you mentioned the containment barn cause it's kind of a confinement barn cause it's kind of a dream of mine to have something like that. No, I, I've, I've noticed them and you know, we've even, uh, had a couple bid here just so we could see what it would cost us. And the thing that keeps me from just jumping into it is because, uh, like very early in my life, uh, my dad raised cattle. But I am not a cattleman. I, I know nothing about it other than what I hear about it from experts. So it keeps me from jumping into it just because I know so little about it. And, but I do know enough about it that you need to be. And uh, there's only a niche of people that have been highly successful in the cattle business. It takes a very honed skill set to be a very successful cattleman. And because of those factors, it has kept me out of it. Not to say I won't ever get, because I'm, I'm crazy enough just to get in at one of these <laughs> days. You'll come down here and there'll be a containment barn. And, uh, but 
you know, I mean that that it that is one of the factors that has kept us out of it thus far is just because our lack of experience and the fear of hey, we're gonna bring in three hundred cattle and every one of them are gonna be dead out there one morning, you know, from <laughs> no, pneumonia they, or whatever. They're resilient. But if you've never if you've never uh, lost your temper with your wife or kids, just get some <laughs> and work them one weekend. And you, there'll be more yelling and hollering, but in a weird, and I mean in a really weird way, we grow, like, we look forward to that. Like, we, so we AI our cows, so we, we set them up, we put cedars in them, we, we give them uh, shots to bring them all into heat at the same time, and, and then, and, and every year I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to get impatient, and I'm not going to yell, but in a weird way, because all the families out there, you know, I mean, you work cows. Cows don't always do what you want them to do, right? So at some point in time, you're hollering at somebody to close a gate or whatever. But it's like nobody gets sensitive about it anymore. So I love it. And, it, you know, we, we go and do that on a weekend. And, like, we're working, and it's frustrating, but we love it. And it's, I don't know, I, don't, I haven't figured out why we love it. We just, we love it because I guess we're a family and we're out there doing it together, even though cows are frustrating, it, uh, I always look forward to weekends that I'm like, Hey, we got to get all the cows up. We're going to give them shots. We're going to bring them into heat or, you know, give them, you know, AI I'm whatever we're going to do. Um, that's a weekend I look forward to. You know, I mean, I think any, uh, you know, that's like a gritty team building exercise, it is. you know, <laughs> it is. and, and all those things like, and this is just agriculture, you know, the agriculture podcast, yeah. you know, like anytime you're doing any of this hard work and you're doing it as a team, uh, people are experiencing the same hardships together, and that is a bonding, like just like that sheep hunt. Hey, if you've never been out in the wilderness where you don't have modern amenities and you don't have access to food anytime you want it, or if you don't have the uh, ability to get warm when you need to get warm or dry when you need to get dry, all these things are character building exercises. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, like when you're talking about working those cows. Uh, you're never comfortable doing it. You know, there's always a possibility you could get hurt or your uh, your family could get hurt or your worker could get hurt, you know. And all those things uh, together, you know, make for an experience that build your character. Yeah, I love that you said team building because I, I it makes those weekends make me a better leader of our family because I, I get a little controlling at times and I want to do everything my way. And when you got... You know, let's just say you got 50 mama cows up in a pen and you've got to work every one of them and every one of them's going to, you can't do it by yourself. I, I can't, at least with our working facilities. Like I got to have one kid, you know, working the back gate. I got to have one, uh, getting, you know, four or five cows at a time up to it. Mama's working the head shoot. My little girl's drawing up shots you know to give to the cows so i have to let go of responsibilities and it does create like our our, we got our own little team if you will it's interesting you say that because i think that in a weird way that's probably why i love it so much i think that makes you you know in agriculture uh to become a really great manager you have to be willing to allocate Mm -hmm. you know and you know my dad uh you know just profound micromanager you know, but in his older age and as we've got, uh, you know, our footprint has grown, he's had to give up a lot of that responsibility that he wants control all to himself. And the first time I ever heard him say it the other day, you know, like as we gained acres and, and uh, footprint grew or, what, you know, we had to uh, first give up the spring to uh, like one of the employees, then part of the planning. And, you know, and like when I would tell him, originally hey i think zach might be a good fit for that sprayer he'd be like what are you talking about (laughs) but then you know like when uh he was given that responsibility and taught taught it effectively he's actually better at it than i was you know like his skill set lends to that job very good and my dad has recognized that and you know he has learned now that it is okay to give up some of those response. And I'm not saying, Hey, don't give up your, you know, every bit of your farm. But if there's something that you're not good at or something that you think somebody else could be better at that works for you, Hey, just try them out on it because there is a chance that they can, uh, maybe have better ideas than you have. (laughs) (laughs) And it's a lot of joy watching somebody. There is 
kind of develop into that. And I've, that, I watch my kids, you know, I remember the first time we did it and it was a disaster. And now they've kind of, you know, I've seen them kind of figure it out, know how to work a cow, know what shots are going to be next, know how to time one going into a head shoot. And, and, and you got to let go to ever give them that chance. That's right. We only know what we know. Don't oh, we? Yeah, yeah. Like we each have to have, uh, we each have to have opportunities and experiences to get better at whatever job it is. Yeah. And then every, this is the great thing about people and the great thing about a business like agriculture is that everybody has a different uh, skill set and a different talent. And uh, within agriculture, it requires so many different talents. And if you have people with diverse skill sets, they will each fall into their role. And overall, it benefits us, you know, as a farm or as a society or community because each person has fallen into the the responsibility that they're best at. Agreed. And if you're a good leader, you can recognize that. Put those people in positions so they can succeed. You know, there's and there's uh, there's also uh, things that people aren't as good at. And if you know they're not going to be effective in that job, don't keep putting them in that job. Take them away from that job and put them in a job where they can be successful. Uh, effectively manage your workforce, and it, it, it'll be good for your peace of mind, and it'll be good overall uh, for your farm. So when are you getting cows? I don't think you'll see them in 2024 here. <laughs> but, you know, uh, we're talking about diversity a little bit, um, and... Uh, how, are we doing okay on time here? Uh, you're about 40 okay, so we, we got a little time here. <laughs> so while we're talking about diversity a little bit, um, you know, I know that, and hey, I know you're a corn and soybean salesman. Not that, to say that you don't sell wheat and other <laughs> products as well, but um, I thought this was pretty interesting is we put a podcast clip on the other day, and it was, uh, it the clip was basically saying, um, you know, corn may not be super profitable and, uh, I'm just paraphrasing this, but corn may not be profitable in 2024, like we've seen it in the past five years. Um, do we need to begin to look in, at a different crop to grow, uh, to shore up some of that lost revenue that we're going to see from, from corn? Well, after I put the podcast clip up, you know, and here in this geography, you don't see a lot of uh, crop diversity. You see corn and soybeans, uh, wheat or rye, and uh, every now and then you'll see some grain sorghum, but we don't have a lot of crop diversity here. And I noticed that a guy from Australia uh, commented on there, and he said, just from my perspective, it looks like you have a very low diversity in your field. Uh, and it would be my suggestion, basically, to diversify some. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, that struck me as kind of profound because that's an outsider perspective looking in. Um, but they have very similar agriculture environment to what we have. You know, like they, they can successfully grow very similar crops to what we can grow, but they have a lot more diversity in their geographic regions than what we have in this individual region. And uh, I believe that's probably a statement that is... Uh, that we need, to, I, I believe this is probably true, that we need to begin looking into other avenues besides just corn and beans on these fields each and every year and add some diversity into our lineups. And I know that's not going to be very easy to do, and it may not be the most popular opinion overall. But, like, I know with uh, your business, uh, and we have a, a bungee here that's very close by, that is going to begin to buy canola out of the purchase region. And there's actually farms here in our local region that have adapted to the, this crop to the rotation this season. Um, and we've done a podcast here about future uh, crops that we may see, you know, come into the rotation. And so we know canola is beginning to have a presence and it's going to increase in acres. Um, uh, just talk about that a little bit. Talk about canola beginning to be adapted into our rotations, and is there other crops uh, that you could see as potential of coming into this geography? Man, the summer full-season crops looks like it's going to be hard to find because the reality of it is is I, I do want diversity too, but um, you got to have a market for it. And so in your summer crops like corn and beans and tobacco, stuff like that, um, gosh, I, I – it does. I don't. I haven't figured anything out other than some produce. There's some guys been looking at some produce, and and that's mostly driven 
uh, because tobacco acres are going going backwards in a hurry, right? You know, it. <laughs> I'm gonna have a squirrel moment here, but we went on that we went on that pheasant hunting trip, and there was if if there was ten people that had cans like looked like dip cans in their pocket, um, nine out of ten of those was just the synthetic nicotine. You know, one of them was actually dipping snuff. So a, a summer cash crop for diversity on revenue and everything around here has been tobacco. And now that's getting that's getting really strained. I mean, they've continued to have cuts for the last several years, and I know a lot of guys that are fixing to get out of it. So, um, from a summer crop perspective, I think it's going to get worse for some of us before it gets better. I don't know what that looks like besides corn and soybeans. Now, the canola piece has been great from a winter crop perspective for some diversity, but it's putting pressure on wheat, not really on on corn and soybeans, and. When wheat was ten dollars a bushel, it was hard to get any traction with canola. Now you're looking at low sixes. Uh, it looks to me like the guys that jumped on the canola this year, uh, you know, at the contract price that I know they got on it, it's going to be a really nice alternative. Um, at the end of the day, I don't want to see it just take wheat acres. I personally, I <laughs> back to the soil health conversation and cover crops and all that. I'd like to see it take acres that aren't getting anything. Yeah. You know, that's being a little selfish, but, you know, if a guy's growing wheat and happy with wheat, I want him to keep growing wheat. But there's some acres that aren't getting anything in the in the wintertime from, from a cover crop perspective. Those are the guys that I'd like to see look at entertaining uh, some canola because it's a cash crop that – but, you know, the reality of it is, is those guys probably weren't growing wheat for a reason because they didn't want to fool with something else. So they're probably not going to fool with canola. But I, I'd love to see that transition on some non already non wintered crop acres. Look at canola. But that canola's come and gone in the in Kentucky for the last 10, 15 years. We've had little runs of it here and there. I think the biggest difference locally is, is, You've not, you've not had a Chevron or a Bungie kind of really get behind it. Uh, obviously, they're talking about investments they're making in a crush plant in the United States. That's going to change it. Um, they've Chevron and Bungie have both come to Pioneer, which fortunately enough for me, I'm a Pioneer dealer, so it's been advantageous for me. But um, they've come to Pioneer as kind of the agronomic arm for that, um, you know, that business. And uh, I feel like we are we've got some early adopters and we've got a lot to learn about canola here uh locally especially about how to plant it how to you know what's the best size for it not to winter kill there's a lot of variables locally but we got good wheat producers those crops are somewhat managed pretty similarly um other than the winter kill issue on canola but i'm i'm really excited about it we had about four to five thousand acres um that we uh that got planted in in the purchase area and uh, it all got done differently. So some got no-tilled, some got worked to a powder, some was behind silage, some was b behind tobacco, some burnt the stalks. Uh, every way you can imagine to plant canola, it got done that way, and which was selfishly nice because ag from an agronomic perspective, we kind of got to see what's going to work and what's not going to work. And um, so far... Um, some type of tillage looks like it's probably going to win win out on uh, canola stands there. Yeah. So if you don't know anything about canola, it's a very small seed. It's it's like the size of a mustard seed. Tiny, tiny, and uh, it has it's in like a rosette. So it when it's seeded, it has to have a very uh, good, I guess, uh, placement. It needs to be around the one inch depth, I think. A little shallower than that. A little I mean, shallower yeah. than that. Yep. And uh, it needs to be able to grow clean pretty much because if it elongates its stem, it exposes its, uh, itself to freeze, right? Yeah, so they're growing. Let's say, let's say a guy no-tills it, and you know how a 200-bushel corn crop looks like with fodder. I mean, there's fluffy fodder several inches above um, the soil line. Well, if you no-till into that, and that plant has to – work its way up through two or three inches of fodder, it's going to put its growing point above that residue. And then that's where the rosette is going to start forming, right? Well, your growing point, the further it gets away from the soil, the less protected it is from a heat perspective. You know, the, the ground's warm, the air is cold, and the closer you can stay to that insulating layer of the ground. So you want your, in this area, you want your growing point on canola as low to the ground as you possibly can. And if you do that, your likelihood of winter kill becomes a lot less. 
where we've no-tilled this crop, that growing point's getting pretty high off the ground, and you're you're exposing yourself to a lot cooler weather because you're further off the ground with that growing point. So our fear is is the stuff that's no-tilled. Outside, if we didn't get a great stand with it, try, try to plant a mustard seed, right, or an alfalfa seed, something that small, you know, half an inch deep consistently in no-till 200-bushel corn residue. It's really, really hard. It's hard to get a soybean in there. Oh, it's man, it. yeah. And so um, we've lear- we're have we learning a lot. Um, obviously, the stuff that was behind silage, the stuff that was behind tobacco, um, gosh, it's, it's going to be a great cover crop. I mean, where we've got good stands of it, there's not a drop of rain that's going to hit the soil directly, right? And so we talked about this the other day just in conversation. You, and most of our erosion comes from a water droplet traveling at, you know, 20 to 25 mile an hour. I think that's about what it travels at, you know, and it hits the uh, soil surface and those clay particles and stuff splash up because of the speed and intensity of that water droplet. But I, I look at these canola fields and I, I see a, a, a hard way to go if you think that it's going to erode because that stuff is a mat on the ground and it doesn't let anything hit the ground. And so I'm excited about it and it's a, it's a good competitive you know it's more diversity for us in a winter crop but the summer crops gosh other than just swapping back and forth on acres from corn you know either more corn one year or more beans the next year i haven't i've seen i've seen less because we're getting away from tobacco i know it is very difficult to uh you know in our geography to because we're a little bit too far north for cotton Mm -hmm. we could probably grow it here but we don't have a gin currently yeah um, you know, and then grain sorghum is not a great fit for us. You know, we get into those very wet periods yeah. and that can be a huge problem for a grain sorghum producer. Those, uh, copious amounts of rainfall. It's a, it's a unprotected seed. It's just out there. And once it's, uh, you know, it needs to be desiccated. Once it's been desiccated and you sit in here with three or four inches of rain, a lot of it's going to go down. You're going to miss a lot of your crop. So, yeah. um, it's it's not a great fit for you know we raise it here occasionally but not a great fit for us and you're right there's not a lot of options for us available currently but we hope that uh over the course of time you know maybe some more come into the uh fold i think if i was a grower sitting brainstorming about diversity and profitability and all those other things i i I, canola is the one thing that comes to mind um immediately but the other thing is what we talked about earlier i'd like to see a guy that has the um, i don't know how to say this has the desire i guess to look at some cattle and some other things you know we've actually we're pretty blessed really when you think about it locally when you think about diversity from a farm perspective with hog barns chicken barns you know lots of stuff Um, We've got lots of options, but I'd love to see the animal impact conversation go on some more farms where guys can't hardly get away from a corn and soybean rotation, but that's making them a living four months out of the year. Sure. You know, uh, to be able to plant a cover crop and not just spend the money on the cover crop seed and get nothing out of it other than soil health and, you know, improvements to actually get some revenue off of that through, um, feeder cows or or whatever it is uh some animal impact of some sort i think that's the focus today i'd love to say there's something coming that's going to compete with corn you know locally but i i don't personally see it i see the cattle thing on winter cover crops being an option more hog barns more chicken barns canola things of that nature hey you know if you i was talking to brandon hunt yesterday and you know, we were talking about, he was talking about sustainability. He had to make a presentation about it, you know. And he said, if I held you down and said, what was the biggest mistake you'd made uh, throughout your time in agriculture, especially when it uh, pertains to sustainability, I said, if you held me down and said, hey, you can restart your ag career and take it any direction you want to take it, the very first thing I'd have done when I came on board was uh, developed a plan with animals in the form of chickens or hogs, probably not cattle, just because I think, uh, you know, in the hog and chicken industry in Western Kentucky, a lot of that stuff is managed uh, for you, not particularly for you, but you're taught to manage it through through somebody that already has prior knowledge in it. And, um, you know, if, if looking back on it, if I would have made those decisions early in my career and I had animals uh, in, the, in that, uh, 
you know, form, like in either a hog or a chicken barn, now I would be able to apply those organic fertilizers, which is what I'm, I want to do, but it's very difficult to find, uh, you know, available on the market. I would have it available here on the farm, and I could take those organics and move them out there into my field. And uh, I didn't do that. And, you know, now the cost of that is um, interest rates are up. Uh, and, you know, the people that have been very established in it have been very successful. But I think that's more of a challenge now just because, uh, like, if you're talking about a hog or chicken barn, you know, you're talking in the millions of dollars of capital investment. Mm-hmm. And uh, with high interest rates, you know, it's just made it more of a challenge. So, you know, and this is like anything, not to say it can't be done. It's just more challenging now than if, if I'd have said 30 years ago when I very first started my career, you know, and jumped into it then. At this point, I'd be a lot closer to, a, to an organic form of farming than what I am. Yeah. In my current model. The one thing I've, I've been hearing more about, at least it's been getting advertised on the radio, and I'm excited for because we have a lot of marginal land, timber land, uh, really rough stuff you just kind of bush hog and, and maintain, is there's been a little bit more chatter about these vital barns locally. Have you heard anything about I, that? I haven't. So uh, vi- I, if you go to a bigger city, I think you may have ever seen vital eggs. So it's like a pasture Again, I'm not going to speak like I'm an expert here. I've I've been hearing about it, and that is, um, it's a it's a pasture raised egg essentially where the chickens can range free throughout the day, and they come back in and lay eggs in the evening time, and then the next day you rotate them to another part of that pasture. Well, they don't want good productive farmland to do that. They're they're asking for you know 50 or 60 acres of of pretty marginal land that may be you know, old CRP, it may be a wooded land or, or whatever, but I think a really cool opportunity because it's where a young producer can get the opportunity to get into something in agriculture. But when you think about the type of farm they're asking for, they're not asking for your eight, nine, ten thousand dollar an acre, you know, 250 bushel f- farm. Um, they're asking for the locally three thousand dollar an acre type of, of farm. So if that thing takes off, I think you talk about a great thing for West Kentucky. We have a lot of marginal land that is not in production that could give a young guy an opportunity to get into agriculture at relatively um, lower cost when you look at a per acre cost. You know, because if a guy says, "Hey, I'm going to start row cropping today," you know, and he's not done it before you know go out and get you some eighty five hundred dollar an acre stuff it's hard right it it is but there's not as many people wanting you know you're going to compete with the hunters and the outdoorsmen for those acres but in all reality it's way more feasible you know and less capital uh as far as a land investment to go down that route so i think it's something you're going to hear more about i think they actually had a meeting in mayfield or something uh, yesterday with some producers, but I'm hearing more chatter. So when you talk about diversity and regrets and animal, there's some guys that are, aren't farming very much that maybe aren't going to look at a, a confinement type of situation for a chicken barn through Pilgrim Pride or something like that. They're going to look at this. Hey, I've already got, what if they've already got 50 acres that's not bringing in any revenue other than it's got a, a deer stand on it, right? You know, what a great opportunity to look at. Um, so the vital stuff, um, vital barns is what they're calling it. You can look it up, uh, but it's just pasture-raised eggs. Yeah. And, and uh, they're looking at West Kentucky pretty hard, it looks like. You know, I think it's pretty – like, I I love the backyard chicken thing. You know, I have a bunch of them. And it, what is neat about the chicken is he is uh, very at home in the woodland. Yeah. You know, I mean, they, they can protect themselves, anything that's overhead – uh, they'll get underneath, you know, they, they're very gamey animals if they're, uh, you know, if they're living outside. So maybe an opportunity for another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, so we're running short on time and I'll wrap this thing up. So if, uh, if you want to work with Jesse here in Western Kentucky or Western Tennessee, you've heard him today and you're like, Hey, I, I want to work with that guy. How do we get in contact with you? Uh, so I, I'm not real tech savvy, but um, I'd say just call me. It's a seeds a personal business. Um, so two seven zero two two six forty four eleven. You can call me. And even if a guy you know isn't 
isn't necessarily saying, you know, I, you know, I'm going to buy all Pioneer now. Um, if he's got questions about the planter fertility we talked about, I mean, I, I love sharing my experiences. So even if it's not buying seed, you just want to run an idea by me, just call me. Yeah, and this is the great thing about Jesse. He, he'll tell you that uh, I'm a customer of Jesse's, but I don't buy 100% of my no. inputs from Jesse. Uh, but he will help you through lots of decisions uh, that are sometimes difficult for you to make as an individual without broad knowledge. Uh, he's very open-minded and uh, he can help you through some of those through his experiences. He's a great agronomist as well and uh, just a great overall guy. So we hope you enjoyed our podcast today. Um, If you did enjoy it, like, share, and subscribe and uh, tell your buddy about it.